This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger. And because of COVID-19, I'm now only going to tell inside jokes. My co-host is John Pazden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and thinks a group of squids should be called a squad. In this episode, John and I will talk about how you can develop mad Chinese writing skills, complete with very practical methods and activities you can do to build those skills, either with others or by yourself. And make sure you stay tuned for John's writing game, Eat Poop, You Cat. Our guest interview is with Shannon Kennedy. Her life and love of languages has taken her on a career path around the world. And out of all the languages she has learned, Chinese has found a special place in her life. All this and more, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you live from Utah. Hey, I'm John Pazden. I am in Shanghai, China. All right, John, we've got quite the show ahead of us here. But before we do, let's get into some reviews. All right, I have a very special review here, but uh, let's save this one for last. I'll start then. This review comes from Scarlett Duna from Spain. She says, thank you for the super useful and entertaining podcast. I've been studying Chinese for almost five months now, and I'm finding your podcast so useful. I love your tips and insights, and it's so motivating. I look forward to every new episode and go listen to it as soon as I get the notification. I started to read the Man Your Companion breakthrough books, and they are amazing. I already finished Ren, and I'm now reading Huama. I hope you can publish soon the breakthrough level books and traditional characters. Thank you from Spain. Hey, well, thanks, Scarlett. And John, when are those traditional level books going to be done? Very soon. Oh, good. Well, I hope so. Really soon. Really. Okay, now I have a review. This one's from Michael5211 in Great Britain. He says, honestly, amazing. I've been listening since the beginning, and it's really made such a big difference to my Chinese learning. Besides being interesting to listen to, it really helps with my motivation. Just hearing other people talking about learning Chinese makes me feel less alone and always gives me more passion to continue. Also, I just bought Mandarin Companion's Level 3 Graded Reader. What? It's amazing. Advertising works. Ha ha. I don't know what uh-huh. I don't know what that is. <laughs> we don't have level three yet. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not a fake one. Maybe met level two. Maybe level two. Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. All right, and then we have from Jason in Oz from Australia. He says positive and informative. This podcast is very positive, and people's abilities to learn Chinese, and it gives useful information about ways to more effectively learn Chinese. The stories from guest speakers give also wonderful advice, such as regular sustainable study and the importance of pronunciation. A question, how good at pinging tones should you get before starting to learn characters? Cheers, Jason from Australia. Hey, Jason, appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll answer that question here in just a minute after we get through our reviews. Okay, and the last review, this is a special one. It is called, Jared, Please Accept My Love. It is from Ninja for Life 102 in the USA. All right, Ninja says, Dear Jared, I remember the day I discovered the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. You stole my heart and made it skip. I love you so much, and you don't even know it. Sometimes I get scared about showing it. My lips lock up because my love is so strong, and the words that would best express my feelings are unreachable as my immense love for you is unfathomable. I find your limitless knowledge of Chinese language and culture to be absolutely mystifying. Your wisdom reaches me in ways I'm unable to express. Mm -hmm. I treasure each and every word that rolls off your tongue more than you'd ever imagine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I want to open up and tell you how I feel, but I guess I've just been too scared. (gasps) I love you, so please know that I always will. Do we really have to be just friends? Mm. John's cool too, I guess. Sorry, John. Keep up the good work, y'all. I always feel so inspired. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Jared, did you write that? Come on. I did not, but I think I'm going to have to go take a cold shower after hearing that. (laughs) All right. And it's a ninja, so that's pretty cool. All right. Ninja for life. We appreciate that. We love you too. I do accept your love. It may not be fully reciprocated, but I accept it. All right. Okay, guys. We have uh, got a great show here. Before we jump into things, John, let's hit up that question that was proposed by Jason and Oz from Down Under from Australia. He says, how good at pinging and tone should you get before starting to learn characters? John, what is your thought about this? You work with a lot of people on this subject. Yep, I, I actually work with exactly that question quite a bit. So let's take that question as two separate questions. So how good at pinyin should you be before you start characters? 
And the answer to that is very good. You really need to get really good at pinyin. People that don't get good at pinyin and they just jump right into characters, they regret it later. So you definitely want to get good at pinyin first. Okay, as for tones, I once wrote an article called The Process of Learning Tones, and I talked about how you go from not being able to distinguish them at all into getting good at distinguishing them. And you definitely want to get to the point where you can make an individual tone pretty reliably. So you can make a first tone, you can make a second tone, you make a third and a fourth, like independently. Being able to string them all together into a sentence without making any tone mistakes, that's going to take a while. So don't worry about that. But you definitely want to get to the individual tone success stage before spending too much time on characters. Well, that's good advice, John. Words from a man who knows. Thank you, thank you. And I pretty much say ditto to whatever John said. What were you saying, by the way? All right, I'm saying let's go on. Okay, well, we're going to talk today about writing, how to become a better writer in Chinese, how to improve your writing skills, and you know things that you can do practically to improve your writing skills in Chinese. Now, I think it's important before we jump into this to define a little bit like what we mean by writing skills. So I think the first thing to say is that when we're talking about writing, we're not necessarily talking about handwriting. There's a lot of people who think like, oh, writing, that means handwriting. And, and no, no, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Just think of typing, okay? If you are proficient in handwriting, I mean, this absolutely applies as well. But as we've talked about many times on the show, handwriting is an entirely unique skill in and of itself. Totally. Uh, I work with people who work on typing quite a bit, not so much on handwriting. So anyway, we're talking about both of those with the emphasis on typing. So one interesting thing about writing is that it is its own unique skill. And you think about it this way, is that, you know, someone can learn to speak a language very fluently, but that doesn't mean that they have to be literate. And this is one of the unique things about writing, is that it is not a naturally learned skill. As one researcher puts it, he says, no one is a native speaker of writing. Yeah, it's worth noting that writing is a technology, and it has been claimed and incorporated into what we think of as language, but it's a technology, and it can exist independently of language. Language doesn't need writing, but obviously writing kind of needs language. And Chinese has its own unique style of writing, very different than other languages. Real quick, John, what are other like logographic-based language systems like Chinese? Logographic, of course, for your listeners being like, you know, character-based or like strictly image-based? Well, the one that immediately comes to mind is Japanese, and it got the characters from Chinese, right? Korean uses Chinese characters a little bit. Even like the Egyptian hieroglyphs kind of evolved into a more phonetic-based system. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not an expert on Egyptian hieroglyphs, but it's mostly Chinese and now Japanese. I appreciate that, John. John always knows that stuff. Anyway, I think it's important that when we're talking about writing is that there are different unique skills about writing. And there's some really interesting research in relation to like your first and second language writing skills. One thing that research has found is that there is a connection between your first language writing skill and a second language writing skill. And that basically, on a very general level, okay, there's a lot of, can be exceptions and caveats about this, but in general is that your first language writing skills do transfer over in a way to your second language writing skills. That's interesting. I find that kind of surprising because um, I remember very clearly struggling so much to write Chinese and feeling that I was, I was okay writing in English, you know, pretty adept at writing, expressing myself in the written form. But when it came to Chinese, oh, so hard. But I guess what you're saying is that even as much as I struggled writing Chinese in the beginning, it was still easier because I had the writing skills in English. Yeah, and so let's talk about some of the skills that you need to know in order to be able to write and write well in a language. All right, well, specifically, let's talk about Chinese. And this actually ties directly into that question that we had at the beginning of the podcast. Because when you type in Chinese, almost everyone uses the pinyin input, right? So you're typing pinyin in order to get the characters. So pinyin, for most people, is a requisite for writing, you know, when we mean typing, in Chinese. So obviously, you need some vocabulary. You need the basics in grammar. You need to be able to type each syllable in Chinese. And then you need to be able to recognize the characters that are the correct ones for the words you're trying to type, right? 
Right. Some of that is similar to English. Like in English, we don't have characters, obviously, but you do have to learn spelling, which is kind of arbitrary. You have to know that, you know, words are spelled differently even when they rhyme. Obviously, characters are a lot harder than that. But anyway, most languages are the same, just Chinese. Sometimes the character knowledge is kind of insane for being able to write properly, but that's just what we're dealing with here. Like, all right, if you don't have good enough knowledge of enough characters and enough understanding on like how to use the language, it, you're probably not going to be able to transfer over a lot of skills you know, into writing in Chinese. But if you have sufficient vocabulary and you have a sufficient proficiency or grasp of the language, now some of these skills are able to now translate over into writing Chinese. Of course, you can also, you know, if you want to, you can distinguish between casual writing, the type of thing that you do on WeChat, which is very similar to what you'd say as you're speaking with a friend. And then there's, of course, formal writing, which has a whole other set of rules and understanding of culture and social norms. But um, yeah, that comes later. Now, I will mention an interesting experience I had with my son when he was in Chinese school in Shanghai. He went through first to fourth grade in a local Chinese school, and he didn't actually really start getting really good Chinese immersion until kindergarten. So that would just been the one grade before first grade. And so when he went to first grade, his Chinese skill still was not on to the same level as his peers. And at home, my wife was teaching him to read English. And of course, at school, he was learning to read Chinese. But we noticed there was something that kind of clicked somewhere at the end of first grade, if I recall. And he just all of a sudden, within a period of like weeks, started being able to like read English and Chinese like decently. And it was it was really surprising. It was just something like all of a sudden it clicked in English and then something just clicked for him over into Chinese as well. And what do you think that was? Do you think it was some kind of like cognitive development? Because, you know, kids' brains are maturing still. Yes, I definitely think you're right. There was some sort of cognitive development. I think what was really surprising to me is that it wasn't something that just happened in one of the languages. It seemed to happen for both. And as I've talked to a lot of Chinese teachers around the U.S. that I've worked with, I've noticed that a lot of them have said that, hey, if they're a good writer in English, they've also seemed to have done pretty well in writing in Chinese and vice versa. If they've been a poor writer in English, then they've been more of a struggling writer in Chinese. And that's a dual immersion program. So it's a little bit different. The kids are progressing in age with the language. So it's a little different than just like foreign language acquisition. But it was interesting to see how those skills, there was a correlation between the two. Cool. And then obviously before kindergarten, he just wasn't getting enough input because the, the human brain is amazing in, in what it can do on its own. And you don't even consciously know that it's happening. But yeah, it needs that input and it needs to kind of incubate that stuff for the cognitive magic to finally happen in there. You know, there was an interesting study found was back in 1986. It found that L2 students, so second language students who were like really good writers, they were also very heavy readers and very good writers in their native language as well. There's definitely correlation. Yeah, that shouldn't be too surprising. The more you read, the more exposure you get to vocabulary and sentence structures that are useful in your own writing. And, you know, once you get that repetition, that natural spaced repetition, then it's much more easier to put it into use yourself actively. So let's talk about some things that you, the listener, can specifically do to improve your writing skills. You know, this is something I've had the opportunity to work on with a lot of students in classrooms. And when we get into writing, the best writing happens when you have something you're interested in writing about. Just to uh, reinforce what you're saying, this is a universal truth about language. Language is about communicating meaning. If you want to practice speaking, then having something that you want to talk about helps a lot because you actually want to communicate that. So it's no different for writing. If you're writing about something that you like talking about, then you're going to like to express yourself in the written form as well, and it's going to work better because language is all about communicating meaning, not just random stuff the teacher says you have to talk about. Amen. So for you guys here, I'm going to go through some specific activities and things that you can do to practice and improve your writing. So you need to have something to write about. Now, a lot of the activities I have will be based on things that you are reading first. So a great opportunity to find something to write about is from a graded reader. And that's what we do at Manor Companion. But follow me here. There's a ton of activities that you can do if you've got some sort of story. 
It doesn't have to be a graded reader. It could be something out of your textbook. You could even be base some of these activities off of a chat that you're having with someone on the other end in Chinese. So, all right, here's one activity. One is called abject adjectives. And I like this activity. It's really simple. It's really easy. So you can select five adjectives. And in Chinese, we call that xing rong zi. And what you do is you'll take five adjectives to describe somebody. Now, this could be somebody, a character in a story. It could be the person that you're talking about or talking with. And now select five adjectives and then use each one of those in a sentence. It's a very simple activity. It doesn't require a high level of writing. And you're not writing paragraphs right now. You're just writing sentences. And it could be short sentences. And obviously, you want to choose something that you want to say, something that's interesting to you or fun or whatever, funny. Exactly. It can get very humorous. All right, another activity. I call this numerous nouns. So from the story you're reading or based on a conversation that you've been having, select five nouns that you find in the story. Pull them out and then write a sentence using each noun. And your sentence can relate to whatever it is you're reading or talking about. And I'd like to point out here that Jared said from your story, right? If you are using a writing exercise to reinforce the words you already know, it's going to work a lot better. If instead you decide to just look up five words in the dictionary, I mean, you can do it, but it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to take more practice to master those words. And you're going to get overall better results if you focus on the words that you've already learned and practice using them. You know, from these two simple activities, something you can also do if you're reading a story is you, know, you can go back and look over what you read. Sometimes you find a grammar pattern or you find a sentence and you can sometimes just change up some of the verbs or adjectives in that sentence. And that just kind of gives you a little bit of understanding of like how that grammar works, the flexibility of the language. And so that when you want to speak with it or use it, it's just kind of more there in your head and on command. All right. You got any more exercises? Oh, yes. I've got a whole bunch. One I really like. It's called Story Timeline. And again, it's a very simple activity. So take a story that you're reading, or it could be, once again, a story that someone told you. If you can, Once again, it could be on a chat. Now, write just a line on a piece of paper, and you start plotting out the timeline of that story. What happened? Okay, so in your story, the character, they first you know woke up in the morning. Okay, great. And then what did they do next? They got ready for the day. Oh, great. Now they went up in the mountains. Okay, great. And then they met some old man in the mountains. All right. And then he tried to give him some alcohol. He drank it and he fell asleep for 60 years. Okay. So there you go. Wait a minute. That story sounds familiar. <laughs> no, don't give it away, John. It's not like the 60 year dream or anything. <gasps> all right. Wait until the end. So anyway, go ahead. All right. So there you go. That's a very simple thing. And you can write little phrases. You can actually just even pull out words. And so once again, these are very simple activities that you can do even if your writing level is not high. All right. So timelines that sounds good. And I'm sure that would be good practice for putting time words in the right location in the Chinese sentence, getting your word order right. Okay. What else you got, Jared? Okay, this is one of my favorite activities because this can be a basis of producing a lot of output, a lot of writing. All right, so read a story. When you get to the end of the story, now you have three options right here. And these are all kind of related activities. But one activity is you rewrite the ending. It could be funny. It could be ridiculous, whatever. Rewrite the whole ending of that story. The second one you can do is write an additional chapter to the book. Continue the story. And the third one is pick a character from that story. It could be a main character. It could be a little side character and write a spinoff story about that character. And this has kind of happened uh, in some you know, movies and stuff. I was going to say The Mandalorian. There you go. Mandalorian's a great one. <laughs> spinoff from the Star Wars. So anyway, you can do that. You write a story about them. And this is kind of fun because if you're enjoying the book and you're enjoying the story, you've probably got ideas and things that you want to write. This is a fun activity. I've actually seen students sit down and just slam out like a thousand characters, you know, and that's actually quite a bit of writing, guys. Have you ever written that much before? Actually, Jared, this reminds me of a recent episode of one of my favorite TV shows, This Is Us. Season four, second to last episode, uh, one of the characters is going to counseling. He's having trouble like dealing with some of the anxiety related to life because of some things that happened in his past. What his counselor tells him is, well, why don't you tell me your version of what you think would have happened if that bad thing that happened in the past hadn't happened. 
And so they actually showed it on the show, like a different version of mm. events where, you know, one person was still alive and all this other stuff happened. And she's like, wait, 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 wait. Um, that's way too optimistic. Why don't you tell me your worst fears about what could have totally happened wrong, even if that one thing hadn't happened? So it was a rare example of a TV show doing something creative like that with their own format. But it's exactly the same concept, and it works really well for writing, too. Well, that's really cool. It's kind of like alternate realities. Yeah, exactly. What if? Marvel, right? What if? Another one I really like is an interactive story. So it's a little bit like a choose-your-own-adventure story. And now you can just write this on paper, but there's some actually pretty cool programs out there. Uh, Twine is one. Another All one's right. called Quest or Squiffy is another one. Anyway, so what you do is, uh, you know, you just start out in a scenario. In fact, you could base it on one of the stories that you're reading. And you could start at the beginning with a story that you've actually read. And, you know, it says, okay, I actually started on one for the Secret Garden once. And it's like, yeah, she wakes up and she notices that no one's around. And then what do you do? Do you just stay there or do you go out the door? You know, and then if she goes out the door, then, oh, she's all the dead people laying around. Everyone's sick. And, you know, what do you do? Do you go touch the dead body or whatever? You know, or you'd stay in the room and then maybe someone finds you and do you get angry at them or whatever. So you can create some sort of really cool choose your own adventure story and you can actually you know link back in storylines and stuff so that can be a really fun activity yeah, cool i'm a fan of choose your own adventure and i've used twine actually it's pretty easy uh, especially if you have any experience with like html or that kind of thing but even if you don't it's pretty easy i gotta say one of my favorite ones is give a gift and this can actually be fun when you're with other people if you're all doing this you pick the main characters from a story you usually just pick more than one you pick like maybe three or four and what you do is you write down a gift that you would give to them. And then you'd write down why you're giving them that gift. And actually, it challenges you and it pushes you sometimes to learn maybe a new word and then understand how to use it and why is this relevant to that person and why would you give that to them? Well, you can give them anything. Like you could give them a trip to Mars if you wanted to. <laughs> you could definitely give them a trip to Mars. Cool. So as you guys can see, there are a ton of activities. All right, Jared, you've got a ton of these activities. Do you still have more? I've got one more. I actually, I have a lot more. This is coming from a teacher's guide that I'm writing. It's an extensive reading in Chinese teacher's guide. So I put together all these activities for writing. So this last one I'm going to talk about is chain stories. It's pretty easy. You need a group of people. It's great for a classroom activity. You can do that right now with everyone who's locked down to the COVID crisis. So, you know, you can still do this online with friends or even email it to each other. So what you're going to do is you get a paper with the first line of a story on it. So it's like a story prompt. And then you write something to continue the story. And you can set up some rules that, hey, you have to write like one sentence or maybe a paragraph or something like that. And then you finish that and then you pass it to the next person or email or send it off or rotate, whatever it is. And then they continue that story. And so everyone's kind of writing onto the story and adding to it and they're kind of passing it around. And of course, then when you get to so long, it could be a, you know how many rounds or maybe six paragraphs, then you read the story to everyone. And it can be pretty funny. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's a great when you have like a study partner or a group of people who are learning together. Actually, there's another variation on that, which I really like. And I've done before, too, for uh, language learning. And it's called Eat Poop, You Cat. Do you know this game? <laughs> I, I, I do not, John, but my interest is now peaked. All right. So the idea is you start out like a story chain. But the second person, rather than adding a sentence, they draw that sentence. After they draw the sentence... They fold the paper so you can't see the original sentence. So then the third person, they don't see the original sentence. They only see the drawing. And then they have to draw a sentence which describes what they see. And depending on the skills of the artist, it might not be easy to tell what they were drawing. And then if you're <laughs> learning Chinese, you have the additional dimension of not being able to express what you think you see. But you have to write something. And you can even set the limitation that you're not allowed to use the dictionary. So you might have to just write something that's really not very accurate, but it's the best you can do with what you have. <laughs> uh, but it just forces you to use what you know. Of course, if you want to, you can allow the use of dictionaries, but that has the disadvantage of you know the very next person who has to then take the new sentence and draw that. If they don't know the word that you just wrote, then they're in the same situation and they can't draw it. It can be really fun. <laughs> you can do you know three, four, five, six iterations. This sounds like a fun game, uh, even in English. <laughs> oh, it's very fun in English. It is hilarious. The first couple times that I played it, um, yeah, we couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> well, there you have it, guys. There are a ton of things that you can do to practice your writing. And remember, writing, it's a skill. 
And so you do need to get out there and you do need to practice that if you really want to improve that skill. Reading will improve your writing to a degree, but overall, you're going to need to practice your writing if you're going to get good at writing. Amen. All right, now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And our sponsor is... Mandarin Companion. (sighs) In the book we're talking about today is our breakthrough level book, My Teacher is a Martian. John, this is like one of my favorite breakthrough level stories. Uh, Might be because it was a story I came up with, but I still like it regardless. (laughs) Yeah, and we said from the beginning that we wanted to do sci-fi stories it's really hard to do sci-fi when you're so limited with words. You know, you can't do spaceships in space. But we managed to do Country of the Blind at level one, and then we even managed to do Martians and Breakthrough Level, only 150 characters. We were really fortunate when we were looking through the characters that we could use for the story, and Huo is one of those, fire. And then Xing, Xing Qi, the Xing star is, was one of those because those are very common characters. But together, Huo Xing is Mars. And boom, there we are, Martian. And then all of a sudden I'm like, dude, I remember reading a book when I was younger about, you know, my teacher is an alien. And I'm like, dude, we could do like my teacher is a Martian. And we did it. Yeah. And it's a fun story. I remember when we were talking about it, I was saying like, oh, we have all these words in the breakthrough level, all these characters and words related to being a student. So we should do a story about students. But that's kind of boring. And it's been done quite a bit. Lame. So enter the sci-fi, the, the Mars, and we got a pretty decent story out of it. It's a great story. So you can go out and get it today. My teacher is a Martian. And you can find it on Amazon, on iBooks and Kobo. You can get the print version, of course, on Amazon as well, or wherever you get your books. So go out there and get it today. Breakthrough level, 150 basic characters. It's a good one. Enjoy. Okay, now we have rants and raves. All right, John, what do you got for us? You got a rant or a rave? All right, so I want to do a rave that's related to our topic today of writing. And these are two tools that I have used in the past for my own writing. The first is a website called Lang8, L-A-N-G-8 dot com. I just tried to open the website and it wouldn't load for some reason. I hope it's still around. I haven't used it in a long time. And I am in China, so sometimes the internet doesn't help me. So the idea is you write something and then native speakers of the language you're writing in give you corrections. And it has a really good system for showing you like, oh, you should have omitted this word or you should have added in this word or you should have used this word. And then there's something very similar on another app that I've mentioned before called Hello Talk. So you can send little posts and it's really good to keep them short um, because it's easier for native speakers to correct them when they're short. And people correct you. Sometimes they do it like literally within five minutes. These are two very good tools to give you casual practice with your writing, and you can definitely keep it fun and light and short. I have good news, John. While you were talking, me here on the other side of the Great Firewall, I looked it up, and Lang 8 is alive and well. You can create an account, which is free. Yay. All right, I get a 403 error when I try to load it, but uh, you probably won't have that problem. Great Firewalled. All right, so what do you got, Jared? All right, I have a rave. Well, this is a very positive podcast. Now, this was something I ran across this last week, and it was very, very cool, and I thought it was something to bring up here. So there's this group of researchers. They've had these volunteers, and they put this electrocardiogram on their head. It measures your brain waves and has like 250 electrodes distributed over different areas of your brain. Anyway, and what they're doing is they're having them read 30 to 50 different sentences. Now, these sentences are already defined, So they're kind of like set sentences, and the computer knows those sentences. And by measuring the brain waves when they're reading these sentences, the AI can detect what it is that they're saying, which is super cool. And it's moving beyond just identifying the sentence. It's actually being able to identify the individual words. So what does that mean? I mean, this is super cool about language is that we actually have now, at least on a very rudimentary level, computers being able to read brain waves and interpret that into actual words. Yeah, it's really cool. I've been watching this type of research develop over the years. It's come a long way. Obviously, it's going to keep getting better and better. I don't really know what this means for language learning. Hopefully, it doesn't mean that language learning ever becomes obsolete. Who knows? Maybe one day it's going to be like Neo in the Matrix. He's like, I know Kung Fu. All of a sudden, it's going to be like, I know Chinese. Maybe. 
Which one are you going to take? Are you going to take the red pill or the blue whale, John? I don't remember what those colors mean. I don't know. Well, look it up, man. It's time to watch that movie again. All right. So do we have an interview? We do. We got it with Shannon today. She's awesome. She speaks more languages than you, John. Oh, oh, oh snap. I don't speak that many languages, dude. Well, only five? Oh, more like four. Are you counting English in there? Yeah. All right, guys. Let's cut to that. My name is Shannon Kennedy. I run a website called Eurolinguist. That's with an E at the end. It's this French spelling of linguist. Shannon and I got in touch a few years ago when she had read some of our graded readers. I am also the head coach of the Fluent in Three Months Challenge, formerly known as the Add One Challenge. I am the resident polyglot and language expert at Drops, and I run a conference called Women in Language with Lindsay from Lindsay Does Languages and Kirsten from Fluent Language. And I also am one of the three co-hosts along with Kirsten and Lindsay of Language League. That's quite a long list of things. <laughs> As you can see, Shannon is knee-deep in languages. What I like about her story is how her pursuit of languages has facilitated connections that have been enriching and even redefined friendships into something deeper than she could have ever imagined. Stay with us. So I think what would be great to start with you is I'd like to hear about like what got you involved in like learning multiple languages is a little bit of a strange story. I was at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. Where are you from, though? California. <laughs> I have Irish heritage, among other things. So I was getting ready to do my master's degree, and I was going over the program requirements, and I was a music major. I started in music performance, and when I went to do my master's degree, I decided to study ethnomusicology, which is kind of this hybrid between anthropology and musicology. And one of the program requirements was that I had a fluent reading ability in Spanish, Italian, German, and French. Oh, yeah. Minor detail, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I already spoke French, so I had that one covered. I had studied it in school. And then I also had French family. So I enrolled in a program for German, French, and Italian. I decided not to do Spanish because they wouldn't let me enroll in any more than three courses at one time. <laughs> I did try. It wasn't for lack of trying. I tried. <laughs> so I was doing the program for that. And then I remember at one point I was sitting with my advisor and he was asking why I was doing all these language classes. And I said, well, it was one of the program requirements. It's on the requirements. And I showed him where it was. And he goes, huh, even I didn't know that. <laughs> so <laughs> I was the only student in the whole program who noticed this requirement and was actually doing it. Turns out it totally wasn't obligatory. But at that point, I was already knee deep in it. And my school had this really amazing language library that was called the Language Lab. And there was like this whole wall of books. I studied across the first resource I had ever seen for Croatian. And my dad's dad was Croatian. And he didn't even know that his dad spoke another language till he was 10 years old. He what? like, yeah, the first time he ever heard his dad speak was they went to like some family reunion in Philadelphia. And his dad was there. And one of his brothers was speaking in this other language that my dad didn't recognize. I guess my grandfather was just kind of sitting there with his arms crossed. And my dad's like, oh, okay, cool. My dad doesn't understand either. And then at one point, someone asked my grandfather, a question and my grandfather replied in Croatian. My dad said his jaw literally hit the floor. He had no idea that his dad spoke another language. Wow. And so I often heard him lamenting about how, you know, he wished his dad had shared that language with him and his brothers. And I guess it kind of just stuck with me. So when I found this Croatian book, I was like, ha, huh, I can finally learn Croatian. I don't need my grandpa to teach me because Unfortunately, my grandpa passed away when I was really, really young, so I, I never really even got the chance to get to know him, but I still felt like it was a way I could connect. So I started to study Croatian independently, and it was really when I discovered that like, I enjoyed doing that. What was enjoyable about it to you? It was something about the process of learning the language. I mean, I am a musician, so there's like this certain degree of discipline and, you know, you study something and you work on it and there's exercises that you do and you can kind of pick specific things to target and improve on in music and languages a lot in the same way. So that personality and that training that I already had, it allowed me to apply it to something new. And then, you know, when I was doing my field work and I was going to France 
the fact that I, you know, was like conversing with these people, interviewing them on an academic level, getting access to these like older French resources and still being able to kind of access the language and understand and like that feeling of success and that like reward was just really gratifying for me. So I was like, well, if I could do it with these languages, then why not try and do it with other languages? But what was it about Croatian? I mean, you had already learned French and you were studying all those other languages, but you said, I'm just curious because you said you felt like it was a little bit connecting to your grandfather who had passed away. I think it was part of it was that connection. But for me too, uh, and I know that this is very different for everyone, like what languages sound nice, what languages are aesthetically pleasing in different ways. But for me, there's just something about the way that Croatian sounds, the pronunciation, the way it all kind of comes together, that just really appeals to me. So, and when I started learning my first words, like my favorite word is naperstak, which means like thimble in Croatian. (laughs) But it's like everything about Croatian that I love. So it has the rolled R. It has a consonant cluster. And there's like just these different qualities and characteristics to Croatian that just, it's like, I just love this language. (laughs) (laughs) That's really neat. Okay, when you came up for graduation, did you actually meet the language requirements for your degree? Yeah, I got my certificates for all of the languages that I was formally taking classes for. So you graduated, and what did you start doing then? So I graduated, and I was out of college, had student debt, and I was desperate to work. I actually ended up working at State Farm. So I was basically answering the phones, calling people who didn't pay their bills, doing things like that. Ah. Um, from there, I kind of got poached away from that position, but it ended up kind of sidestepping me into an industrial tech industry. I was in that position for six years and to kind of maintain my sanity and continue to have a purpose for all of the language study I was still doing outside of work. I started my blog and writing about my process for learning languages. Um, Because with music, I was always kind of taught to pay it forward. I had a lot of really amazing mentors in music. And my parents constantly told me, it's like, you know, these people are doing this for you. So it's your responsibility when it's your turn to do it for them. And I did. I had this website called Teen Jazz that I ran for like 12 to 15 years where I shared everything that I learned being a professional musician with younger musicians. So I was like, okay, I'm doing this for music. So I need to do this for language too, because there's a lot of things like as someone who is kind of studying languages on my own that took me way too long to figure out. So if I can help someone figure this out a little bit faster, you know how it is where you're studying a language and then six months down the road, you find this resource and you're like, oh, I wish I had this like six (laughs) months ago. (laughs) What are some of those things you feel like you learned along the way that really helped you in learning languages in general? Okay, so when I first started to learn Chinese, I was listening to an audio program exclusively, watching lots of YouTube videos, so I didn't connect the written language or pinyin or anything right away. I had this kind of weird, my own personalized romanization, which was Mm. awful, Uh, (laughs) (laughs) looking back at it now. And I wish I had like taken the time to learn pinyin earlier on and that I had gotten into characters and reading a little bit sooner than I did because learning Chinese characters, there's just so many. Well, what got you into Chinese? (laughs) So another funny story. So I was done with school. I was learning Croatian. I was like, okay, I'm ready to take on another language. And I'd always been into Japanese culture and Japanese things. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll learn Japanese. And I was like, uh what about Chinese? So I asked someone, I said, should I learn Japanese or Chinese? They basically handed the decision over to them because I couldn't decide for myself. (laughs) And they're like, you should learn Chinese. It's way more practical. And I was like, okay, I'm going to learn Chinese because it's way more practical, which is obviously in hindsight, not the best reason to start learning a language. But thankfully, I started to learn it and I fell in love with it. I especially now love characters. I love seeing like the components and the radicals that come together to form a character and then different characters that come together to form a worm and word. And it's like, ah, it's like, it's like almost like a puzzle. And it's like interesting to me. It's like, Hey, do you know that the word for tooth is this radical, (laughs) this radical? (laughs) There's that saying as this, you know, the, the doors of history turn on small hinges. So it's kind of like you just handed over your decision. Someone's like, ah, yeah, Chinese, you know, what if they just said that? Oh, you know, Japanese, you know, you, you probably learned Japanese instead. Well, I I did learn Japanese later on, and I do speak Japanese now. Well, there we go. Yeah. It ended up not being an either-or question. I I mean, at the time, 
I don't know. This is kind of this thing that I had even earlier on, like when I was in my teens, I was like, I'm going to learn eight languages. And at that point, I only spoke French and English. And it was, I don't know where this number eight came from, but it was like always kind of there in my head. And so then later when I actually started to more seriously pursue languages, I was like, hey, I might actually hit that eight. And I've gone way past that. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> ba, it's ba, baga. You ba. Know? So, so it's a lucky number, right? So you must have intuitively known it. And I'm also curious to know like how like your Chinese progressed a little bit because just for our listeners here because you were juggling a lot of different languages and you're learning a lot of different things and and maybe you can share a little bit of like you know, what was your experience learning some of these other languages how did that help you learn Chinese So with Chinese I kind of started it and I found out about the HSK exam and so I decided that my goal was within one year one calendar year to sit the HSK4 exam so I bought the HSK practice books. I started working with a tutor probably, I don't know, maybe four months into the project. I was basically consuming any Chinese resource I could. I joked, you know, oh, when I have a kid, I'm going to speak to them in Chinese. And I'm going to like, I'm going to learn it well enough that I can use it with my child. (laughs) And so I'm studying the language getting ready the night before my HSK exam, I found out I was pregnant, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, which is a little bit, it was a piece of news to receive right before an already stressful exam. So then like after sitting the exam, I was like, okay, now I need to really get serious. I've got nine months (laughs) to get Chinese down enough that I feel comfortable like singing lullabies to my child and then like, you know, saying basic things to them. So that was something that I was working on. And then when my son got a little bit older, I think it was around when maybe six months or enrolled him in like a Chinese immersion class where it was a mommy and me thing. But every time I would go to China or Singapore or Taiwan or wherever, I would buy as many children's books as I could. And then as he started to get older and develop his own interests, then it was like, okay, I've got to find the Disney Cars books in Chinese. <laughs> His first obsession was finding Dory. So then it was like, okay, I found Finding Dory in Chinese, the movie. And then I got the books in Chinese. And then he became this vehicle for me to like kind of figure out what I needed to learn next. You know, as he starts getting older and getting curious, he'd point at something like the fire sprinkler in the ceiling and be like, what's that? And I'd be like, uh. And I'd have this list of words that my tutor and I each week would go through. I remember one lesson where we literally sat down and went through every kind of vehicle you can imagine. So. Wow. Well, that's quite admirable. I totally know what you mean, especially like on the movies. You know, my kids, you know, we, whenever we go to China, get all the Disney movies or whatever, because they have the Chinese track, right? It was like, you're watching this with Chinese. They're like, no, I want to read it. <laughs> so they turn on the Chinese and they just start watching. Yeah. <laughs> Well, tell me then, it sounds like you've really gotten involved in Chinese, perhaps more than some of the other languages. Why has that been with Chinese in comparison to maybe you know, French or German or even Croatian? Ugh, good question. German, I have a love-hate relationship with. So the minute I finished school, I was like, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, when I started learning it, Chinese, like I just totally fell in love. And right before my exam, I went to Beijing. For a week and my tutor met me um, there. She kind of left me on my own to get my subway tickets and buy food and introducing me to different things. And I just loved being there. I loved everything about it. I loved being able to use the language. I know this probably sounds a bit silly, but if I walk up to someone and I say something to them in French, they're like, oh, you're French? And then they start speaking to me. I'm like, no, I'm not actually French. They're like, okay, well, it's not a surprise really that you speak French because French. But if I walk up to someone who speaks Chinese, the reactions are just always like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And uh, there's just something a little bit gratifying in that. And I know that probably sounds totally silly, but I just... I love it. And one of my best friends I met because I was shopping with my mom and she was in the dressing room. I was waiting for her and these two girls were waiting for their mom as well. And they were speaking Chinese and I felt a little bit awkward because I was kind of eavesdropping, but they didn't know that I understood because it didn't appear that I understood. And at one point the mom comes out and I was like, I think that dress is pretty. And like one of the girls almost fell over they like all stumbled back several steps. And then the next (laughs) several dresses, they included me in the process. They're like, what do you think of this one? What do you think of this one? And then at the end of it, one of them came up and asked for my number. And we are really close friends now. We do all sorts of things together. She's my travel partner. 
We've been out of the country and around the country together. I just wow. went to the other girl's wedding. The One of the two sisters just got married and I went. So I got to go to my first Chinese wedding. And that would have never happened if I didn't speak Chinese. And, you know, what I went and did in Beijing would have never happened. Some of the things that I've done with music would have never happened if I didn't speak Chinese. I feel like I've hit all of these different personal rewards that just like have kept me going and kept me really involved and really in love with the language. I love hearing that story. That That is a great story. You know, one of the great things about Chinese is Chinese people, they, they intuitively understand that it's a difficult language. And you also, I love that story you're sharing about running into those girls at the store. This is something I brought up on the show before. And sometimes when you meet like a Chinese person and you like hit it off, it's like instantly bond. We're blood brothers. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, yeah, that's so true. And then I also think like, you know, the experience that I've heard from other people who don't speak Chinese is like, oh, I always feel like I'm not a part of that group or that I'm not going to be accepted into that group. And I'm like, that's just not my experience at all. Just because it's like, okay, I made this effort to learn your language. And, you know, people really appreciate it. Yeah. I want to hear about some of the stories you've had of like breakthrough experiences. Yes. Okay. So I can tell a really great story. When I was living in Ireland, I lived in a house with nine people, and three of my roommates were from China. My house was three floors, and all of my Chinese roommates happened to be on my floor. So our doors were always facing each other, and we shared a kitchen. So each floor had its own kitchen. So I shared my kitchen with these three people, and I would constantly run into them. I'd go into the kitchen to cook my dinner. I was by myself. They would all be chatting in Chinese. And of course, at this point, I did start to enjoy languages. So I would say, oh, teach me something in Chinese. And they like so that we get like this little paper all sit around the table and they'd start to tell me like what their Chinese names were and like my first few words. And I remember them making fun of my pronunciation. Like (laughs) I, I could not get the tones right. I could not get the sounds, the syllables right. Like everything was just horrible. And they'd like, they would make fun of me for it. And the only Chinese word that I can tell you that I remember from this era was sui bian because they were a boyfriend and a girlfriend. So the girlfriend constantly is like sui bian, sui bian. (laughs) So <laughs> So that was all I picked up from my Chinese roommates after, you know, almost two years of living with them. But that's okay. So then fast forward to October 2018. And at this point, I completely lost touch with them because we were friends on Facebook while they were in Ireland. But obviously, that's difficult to access in China. So once they went back to China, I completely lost touch with them. Their emails didn't work anymore. I work for a Japanese music company, and because I speak Japanese, Chinese, and English, they wanted me to go to kind of liaise between the three groups. So I was in Shanghai, but for whatever reason, right before I went to Shanghai, one of them sent me a a connection request on LinkedIn. And I was like, this is perfect. Peter, I'm going to be in Shanghai. How far are you from Shanghai? They're like, we live in Shanghai. I didn't. Oh, nice. Yeah. So. They decided to take me out for hot pot, which that's another funny story because the whole time I was living with them, they're like, you know what hot pot is? I was like, yeah, like potluck. They're like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's where like everyone gets together and you have a bunch of different dishes. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what a potluck <laughs> is. <laughs> and they're that's like, not hot pot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like, no, you don't understand. And I was like, okay, I'll just trust that I don't understand what this is. And so we go. And of course, at this point, you know, I've been speaking Chinese for about two years. I finally get to go have hot pot with them. So they take me to a hot pot restaurant in Shanghai. And prior to this point, when I was living with them in the UK, like 100% of our conversation was in English because I didn't speak Chinese. So they had to speak English to me. And like, you know, I'd help them with their English papers, check, you know, spelling and things like that. And then when I went to meet them in Shanghai, it had been several years since they had been in the UK. So they had forgotten 90% of their English to the point that they were not comfortable using it with me. So that entire evening was in Chinese. And like we picked it up and just like hung out in Chinese as though it had been what we had always done. And I mean, that was huge for me because the language that you establish a relationship in is the language that the relationship stays in. It's really hard to change the language of a relationship. So that was like a huge thing for me. The fact that I was able to change the language of my relationship with my three roommates. What was that interaction like? I felt more like I was one of them. Like the whole time I was living with them. These were people that I lived with, but I always kind of felt like the odd one out. 
we would do different things together as a group. Like we even at one point, all of us went to Scotland together. We took a boat, but I still always kind of felt like the odd man out because, you know, they were most comfortable chatting to one another in Chinese and not in English. And when I was in Shanghai with them, you know, it'd been several years since I had seen them, but it felt like it hadn't been like we just picked things off where it left off. And then I felt like I was actually part of the group that time. Like I was involved in 100% of the conversation because they didn't ever at any point have to switch to Chinese to discuss among themselves what something was in English to explain it to me and then maybe give up or maybe not quite get there. And so there were these barriers between us in English that now that I was able to speak Chinese with them, there weren't any longer. So it just created just a completely different feeling. Well, that's a special experience. Well, I want to know about your job. Tell me about how Chinese has really impacted like your career. I wouldn't have been sent to Shanghai if I didn't speak Chinese because, I mean, I went to bridge things between the Chinese team and it's particularly the English speaking team. So that opportunity just would have never happened if I didn't speak Chinese. And just day to day, using the language with my son, playing the versions of my video games that I enjoy most in Chinese, you know, because I happen to know how to find an IQ, which is like the Nintendo 64 Chinese version controller. Um, I mean, there's just things that are part of my life that like hot pot (laughs) that I know about now that otherwise wouldn't exist in my life. Well, if you could go back and you could do it over again, what would you do differently in learning Chinese? I would have focused less on preparing for the HSK exam (laughs) because it is an exam. I probably would have focused more on just speaking and connecting with people first because I think just for languages in general, that connection is a huge part of why I enjoy doing it so much. And wasting a year on exam prep where my head was buried in a book and I wasn't out talking to people, I think that that would be the one thing that I changed. I don't know if you've seen our Instagram meme account. I have a meme that says, says, you can't fail the HSK if you don't take the HSK. (laughs) (laughs) What advice would you give to someone who's trying to learn Chinese right now? Don't be intimidated by it. I think we tell ourselves that Chinese is this really difficult language. And I've studied more than 13 languages now. And because I loved it, it wasn't difficult. So languages are as difficult as you make them. And, you know, Chinese kind of gets this bad rap because it's so different from English. There's not really any shared vocabulary. The grammar is completely different, like the ba structure. Oh, my gosh, the ba structure. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it seems like it's just this huge mountain to climb, but you just kind of take it a step at a time and you'll get there. And it's so worth it. I mean, for me, I almost (laughs) like Chinese almost feels more worth it than some of the other languages sometimes. Oh, really? How so? The fact that, you know, you go to China and a lot of people still don't speak English, whereas if you go to Europe, almost everyone speaks English. But, you know, so then I can actually communicate with people. I remember one time when I was in Beijing, a sudden rainstorm happened. I wasn't prepared for it. So I got stuck under this little tiny awning with a Chinese lady who didn't speak any English. And I was stuck there for a good 10, 15 minutes. And I could have stood there awkwardly next to her going, huh, yeah. (laughs) But because I spoke Chinese, like I actually got to talk to someone, you know, during that time. One other thing I was interested to hear about, you said at the beginning you didn't really study characters. What kind of impact did literacy have on your language learning? Well, at the beginning, I mean, it had a huge impact because when I finally was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I was just like, oh, my goodness. Like if I had started doing this earlier on. You know, I at least could have started to learn some of the easier radicals and things like that so that when I'm looking at this wall of text that I have to prepare for the HSK4 exam, it's like, you know, here's a paragraph that you have to read and now you need to answer questions about it. And I think there's a couple of things that are really difficult about Chinese. One is that you don't actually have to know how Chinese sounds to be able to read in Chinese. As long as you know what the character meaning are, you can still read in Chinese without knowing like how to actually say what you're reading, which is a little bit strange. And so like there's actually an extra connection that you have to form to connect speaking the language to reading the language. You can literally learn to read in Chinese without ever learning to speak the language. I don't think that exists for any other language. So I already had the connection between what I was hearing and what I was saying, but then I had to go back 
and add new connections in when I started to read, which just I think it created extra work for me than if I had taken the time to at least kind of start to build that at the beginning. Wow. Well, that's great. Shannon, tell us where can people find out more about you? Where can people find you online? So my website is eurolinguist.com, E-U-R-O-L-I-N-G-U-I-S-T-E dot com. Uh, so we'll you put can put a link in the show notes for that too. So you can find me there and all of my social profiles and everything are linked to that. But if you want to find me anywhere, I'm Eurolinguist on every platform except for Twitter where it was already taken and I'm Eurolinguist uh, SK. I know. Those jerks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Shannon. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you again for having me. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, phlebotomists, ministers, sidewalk chalk artists, homeschooler, and that one guy named Steve. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena. We just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jerry Turner, and our editor is James Harper. I'd like to thank our guest, Shannon Kennedy, and I'd like to thank my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Paston. See you next time.